Our final speaker is a fitting match for the first three, and he has more than enough degrees to prove it. He's a Cistercian alumnus who graduated in the class of 1992. After that, he attended Princeton University, where he graduated summa cum laude with a degree in molecular biology. He then returned to Texas to attend medical school at the University of Texas, where he received his doctorate. Medical school was followed by a residency in otolaryngology at the Joint Columbia Cornell Program in Manhattan, followed in turn by a fellowship in head and neck surgical oncology at the University of Toronto in 2007. He completed a second fellowship in microvascular reconstructive surgery, also at the University of Toronto in 2008. After years of postgraduate education, he became the first person to identify a novel independent prognostic indicator in head and neck cancer. He is a man who has worked both home and abroad, and to date he has worked and taught in several countries, including Liberia, Sierra Leone, Haiti, Saudi Arabia, and Madagascar. In 2011, he graduated with a master's degree in global health from Harvard University, and in 2015, he received his PhD in health policy from Harvard University as well. Today, he serves as an assistant professor of otolaryngology at and of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's a research director at the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change and an otolaryngologist at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. However, our commencement speaker is more than an intellectual. When not working and helping low-income countries around the world, he's an avid photographer and rock climber, and he's also competed on seasons eight and nine of American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> Without any further ado, it is my honor to present the commencement speaker for the class of 2019, Dr. Mark Schrein. Bishop Kelly, Father Abbott, Father, you know what, actually, before I even start, my old form master is sitting midway down the aisle over there. Bob Hauser is celebrating 50 years of Cistercian today and his 70th birthday. So can we give him a round of applause? Father Paul, Father Ambrose, Mr. Hauser, fathers, teachers, family, friends, parents, and most importantly, men of the 50th graduating class of Cistercian Preparatory School. Congratulations. Congratulations on completing an arduous eight years of some of the best education this nation has to offer. Congratulations on making it to this landmark, this threshold, beyond which lies the great unknown, being an adult, creating a life. And it's a really strange threshold. All three of the valed valedictory speeches talked about that, that you're leaving a family and you're going out into the unknown. A hello from the other side. 27 years ago, I stood at this same threshold, on this very stage, wearing these same robes, in front of a similar sea of faces. And 27 years ago, I gave a speech to the parents in the room. And I begged them, I pleaded with them to let their sons go. I told them it was time for them to allow us to grow, to spread our wings, to find our own paths, and to become the men that we knew we could be. And I meant it. And then, for 15 years, I did nothing with it. See, I never wanted to be a doctor. Growing up, I adamantly, actively resisted being a doctor. I wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> because what little boy doesn't want to be a rock star? Or I wanted to be a philosopher, because what little boy doesn't want to be a philosopher? Or I wanted to be a linguist, or briefly I wanted to be a Cistercian priest. But I am the firstborn son of an immigrant family. And as any firstborn sons of immigrant families here know, we have three options. Doctor, lawyer, or failure. <laughs> so I went to med school. And I'll be honest with you, I hated it. I hated every single minute of medical school, of residency, of fellowship, of the life of a full-time clinician in the United States, I hated all of it. 
For however earnest I was in that speech 27 years ago, 27 years ago about creating my own life, I instead found myself walking a path that I didn't want to be on. A path that was predetermined for me by my upbringing, my education, the expectations of my family, my mentors, my society, and my own self. Not really loving where I was going, but not quite sure how to get off of it. So I became what I never wanted to become. I became a doctor. Which is a really weird complaint, isn't it? On its face, this predetermined path is a really good one. A bit over 15 years after leaving Cistercian, I was taking out head and neck tumors from patients in a, a big northeastern city. This, this truly is the apotheosis, the pinnacle of the American dream, right? Cachet, privilege, income, stability, job security, and the chance to own a Jaguar. It's what, it's what any parent would want for their child. So on the outside, this predetermined path is amazing. But on the inside, I was dying. Now, if this sounds depressing, bear with me for a second, because I got off that path. Eight years ago, I quit the full-time practice of medicine in the US. And today, I get to work as a surgeon on a hospital ship in West Africa. And when I'm not there, I get to spend my life teaching about, researching, and working towards improving the care of the surgical patient in some of the world's poorest communities, and it is amazing. Getting off the predetermined path that I was on after I left here, becoming the man that I, I thought I could be 27 years ago, that was a terrifying journey, but it also led to finding meaning, fulfillment, and deep contentment. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today, because today, you're facing one of the bigger changes you're going to face in your life. There are bigger ones. Getting married, having kids, retiring, being elected president, winning the Nobel Prize, but all those are far in your future. And this change, it, excuse me, is a big one. Because the decisions that you make in the next few years are by definition gonna shape the course of your life. Starting today, starting when you walk out those doors, you have the chance to create for yourself a life of purpose, of meaning, and of deep contentment. Or you can make the same mistakes that I did the first 15 years after Cistercian. You could follow the path predetermined for you by your own upbringing, by your own expectations. It's really easy to do. You could find yourself pursuing safety, security, cachet, privilege, income, and stability. But let me tell you that no amount of safety, security, cachet, income, privilege, or stability will ever be enough to surmount the existential dread of living a life that you know you don't want to be living. So if you'll permit me, I want to share four lessons that I have learned in making that transition from the broad, well-trodden path to that life of purpose, meaning, and deep contentment. Lesson one, don't pursue happiness. The pursuit of happiness will lead to unhappiness. It's one of the most fundamental truths that I've learned in the, in the last three decades. The only way to guarantee that you will be unhappy in your life is to orient your life towards being happy. Because at our foundation, human beings are adaptable. It's a really good trait. It's what allows us to buckle down, to put our nose to the grindstone, to get all the work that you guys have done in the last eight years to get that work done. It's what lets any noxious stimulus seem less noxious as time goes on. But this adaptability has its downsides. Because of it, we live on what researchers call a hedonic treadmill. Nothing we can ever acquire fully satisfies us. Whatever we think will make us happy might, in the short term, give us a short-term burst of pleasure. Whatever is supposed to take away our fundamental ennui, whatever is supposed to keep us safe, whatever is supposed to solve our problems might do so in the short term. But it's never enough, and because that short-term pleasure is accompanied by a burst of dopamine in our brains, the come off, the crash, leaves us feeling worse than we felt when we first started, so we stay on this treadmill, always looking for the next dopamine hit. It's one of the reasons that Americans are happier planning their vacations than actually taking them. For me, I was pursuing that American dream, and specifically I was pursuing safety and security because that's what I thought was going to make me happy. It turns out that I was wrong. It turns out that if you orient your life towards happiness, you're very likely to be unhappy. You're very likely to wake up at the age of 40 or 50, having achieved the pinnacle of the American dream, because let's be honest, the education that you guys have just gone through has set you up for success. But you're very likely to have achieved that dream, and then to look back on your lives and think these were lives of regret management, of all the what ifs, and not lives of true fulfillment. So lesson one, don't pursue happiness. What then should you do? Should you be pursuing? What then should you be doing? Which is lessons two and three. Lesson two, I want you to examine what you worship. 
Now this seems like silly advice because you worship God. Or maybe not. Maybe unbeknownst to all but your closest friends, something you would never tell your parents or the priests here, you are staunchly a-religious. Maybe you know better than to worship some silly sky fairy that lays down laws about who sticks with him. Or maybe you're something in between. Maybe like the fastest growing segment of the American population, you consider yourself spiritual, but not religious. But no matter which group you identify with, a lesson about examining what you worship might feel like it doesn't apply to you. Except it does, because everybody worships something. The late David Foster Wallace said it best in a speech he gave called This is Water. He says the only choice we get is what to worship, not whether. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, he goes on, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never feel like you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly and when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they bury you. That's the rub. No matter what group we identify with, no matter what group we fall into, it's very likely in our day-to-day -day lives that what we're worshiping is far more tangible, far more corporeal than we would like to admit. It's probably something like success or money, personal freedom, national freedom, our bodies, our image, our reputations, fame, marriage, children, the perfect job, being the best parents. These are the things that we think about when we're not thinking about anything else. Now we know intellectually that we shouldn't be worshiping these things, but it's so easy because they're incarnate, they're touchable. We get mired in our daily pursuits, daily pursuits of the homework assignments, daily pursuits of the sports uh, competitions, daily pursuits of figuring out what your major is going to be. And mired as we get into these daily pursuits, what we have lost is our sense of wonder. We have forgotten how to worship and we have lost sight of what it is that deserves our worship. So lesson two. Examine on a daily basis the things that you happen to be worshiping that day. Examine the things that you're pursuing. Examine the things that you think about when you're not thinking about anything else. Examine your dreams and question them. Because here's the thing, all those things that I listed, fame, career, marriage, children, that perfect job, those are all really good things. I'm not telling you not to pursue them. You should pursue them. But they cannot become your ultimate things. Once they become your ultimate things, not only do they leave you unhappy, they will, as David Foster Wallace wrote, eat you alive. So instead, find silence. Listen to the quiet, numinous moments in your life. Find what Marcus Borg, the theologian, has called the thin spaces, the places where the veil between you and the divine is just a little bit less opaque and sit in those places. Rediscover your own sense of wonder. Rediscover what worship means to you. Rediscover what it is that you want to worship and then set your eyes on that. Lesson three, much more tangibly, in everything you do, keep your heart toward the poor. It's been my experience that the only way to deep contentment, the only way to move from a life focused on success to one of meaning, is to keep your eyes on what you worship and to keep your heart toward the poor. The only thing that takes us away from our irascibly self-centered existence is to make sure that our existence is in the service of others. And really in the service of others. Not in the service of others as a way to glorify ourselves. Not in that counterintuitive pride that we can fall into when we find ourselves, quote, doing good. No, it's actually in the service of others. It's actually in turning our hearts towards the poor. These obviously are not original thoughts. Jesus had them. Matthew 25, he tells the parable of the sheep and the goats, of separating them and sending the sheep into the kingdom that's been ready for them since the world's foundation. Why? Because, we all know this, I was hungry and you gave me to eat, thirsty and you gave me drink, to drink, homeless and you gave me a bed. The sheep are confused, they're taken aback, what are you talking about, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or, or homeless? And his response is whenever you did this to the least, to the overlooked, to the ignored, to the disparaged, to the poor, you did them, to me. Now demographically, this is Texas, most of us in this room come from a Christian tradition. But Christianity is in no way unique in this focus. Well, people of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad wrote, you are the best people ever raised for the good of mankind because you have been raised to serve others. 
Leo Tolstoy, the sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. Albert Einstein, only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. But let me get a little bit personal here. You know those quiet, numinous moments that I talked about in lesson two? That's where I learned lesson three. After those 15 years of post-secondary education, college of medical school residency and fellowship, most of which I hated, I'd become pretty good at taking out tumors from patients' heads and necks, but I'd also become pretty resigned to living a life pursuing safety and security. And in the middle of that, I found myself on a hospital ship in Liberia, West Africa. I walked down the forward stairs of that hospital ship, took a left-hand turn and a right-hand turn into the maxillofacial ward. I saw a dozen patients with head and neck tumors at various stages in recovery. And it hit me in that quiet, numinous voice. Oh, this is what I have been training for 15 years to do. Those quiet, numinous voices, find them and listen to them. Lesson two, doing that, examining what you worship, that's gonna be a lifelong journey of maintaining an open learner's posture on a daily basis. That one's never settled. But lesson three, keeping your heart toward the poor, that is something you can start doing today. It doesn't have to be on a hospital ship in West Africa. It doesn't have to affect 100 people. It doesn't have to be grandiose, but it has to be. In everything you do, keep your heart toward the poor. All right, last lesson. Learn to fail. One day, you're gonna wake up with a pretty good sense of what it is you want the rest of your life to be. If you remain open, if you remain honest, if you never stop listening, if you sit in those still, thin places and listen to that quiet, numinous voice, one day you'll wake up having heard it. And you will know deep down whom or what you want to worship and how you want to turn your heart toward the poor. And it'll probably look nothing like what you're doing right then. This was a really scary realization for me. The road toward fulfillment was not the road that I was walking, and it will most likely not be the road that you start walking either. And what this means for you in the next year or two is you're going to have to make some very intentional decisions about what you want the rest of your life to look like. The thing is, there is a broad path, an easy path, a default path. For those of you especially who want to go into the white collar trades of medicine, of business, of consulting, engineering, the law, that path is well trodden, it's attractive, it's lined with beautiful hedges. You could very easily walk out these doors, go to college, major in biology, ride the moving sidewalk through residency and fellowship, and spend 30 years of practice and retire with a nice house and a Jaguar. And if that description fills you with joy, then by all means, please do it. But if it doesn't, if it niggles at you a little bit, if it fills you with a bit of existential dread, if it starts to feel like what David Merritt Jones has called enduring life until you exit the planet, then you're going to have to make decisions to make sure that you don't wake up at 50 looking back on a life of regret management. And that's going to require thinking intentionally about them. That may mean never signing a mortgage, so you're free to serve the poor. It may mean not getting into that relationship because the other person's heart doesn't match yours. It may mean not going out that Friday night, or it may mean forcing yourself to go out that Friday night. Whatever it means, though, it's going to mean taking risks. It's going to mean doing things that other people are telling you you shouldn't do. It's going to mean closing doors that others think that you should leave open. It's going to mean doing stupid, silly, and crazy things. And you know what? Sometimes you're going to get it wrong. You're going to mess up. You're going to fail. And I'm not going to lie to you. Failure sucks, but it's likely, given where you are right now, that you're not super used to it either. It's because everything around us is structured towards success. Failure is not rewarded. Failure is punished. Failure is to be avoided. Failure, by definition, is failure. However, getting off that default path is going to require making scary decisions, and that's going to require failing, so you might as well start getting used to it. And not just getting used to it, but actually falling in love with it. Falling in love with the fact that failure is a signal to you. You are trying something. You don't yet know how to do. You don't know what the answer is at the end of it. Sir Edmund Hillary was the first Westerner to summit Mount Everest. We know this about him. But what we don't often talk about is the number of times that Hillary tried to get up Mount Everest and didn't make it. And after the second time he tried to summit the mountain, he turned back to the mountain. And he said, I will come again and conquer you. Because as a mountain, you cannot grow. But as a human, I can. 
His failures are how he grew. Our failures are how we grow. So whatever decisions you're going to face in the next few years of your life, think very intentionally about them. Are these decisions the easy ones? Are they lined with beautiful hedges? Are they safe? Or are you likely to fail at them? Because those are the ones that are going to bring you closer to the life you want. Your challenge then, as you walk out these doors, is twofold. Find the thing that you worship and find the way that you serve. To do that, don't pursue happiness. Examine every day what you are worshiping. Keep your heart toward the poor and make scary decisions. The next few years will be confusing. They're going to be years of exploration. They're going to be years of construction. They'll be years of crucifixion and years of resurrection. But they're also years of beauty, of heartbreak, of joy, of tears, of strength, of grit, of awe, and of worship. Keep your life open. Cultivate your sense of wonder. Listen to the quiet, numinous voices. Don't take the easy road. And above all else, keep your eyes on what you worship and keep your heart toward the poor. Congratulations, class of 2019. I am so excited to see what happens with you next. Some of you are going to change this world, but all of you can change the world for one person. Go and be the men you know you can be. Thank you.